I'm Larry Walther. This is principlesofaccounting.com chapter 23 and this chapter is about reporting to support managerial decisions. This particular module is on segment reporting. A segment is a discrete business unit for which separate financial information is prepared and evaluated by the chief operating decision maker within the organization. So we are disaggregating corporate information and looking at it by a unit of operation. The decision maker usually has authority to allocate resources and judge performance. A segment can be a region, territory, division, product category, department, or any other classification. This is a highly subjective determination. The goal, however, is to divide or allocate overall performance outcomes to the various moving pieces that make up the entire entity. In evaluating segment income, great care must be taken to develop a very logical structure. Indirect cost, for example, may be necessary cost for the overall organization to function, but there's a question of how they should be allocated to individual segments. Further, direct costs can become indirect as they are pushed down within an organization. It's easy to overlook this facet. For example, if you share an apartment with a roommate, the electricity consumed by that apartment is a direct cost for the apartment, but for each of you individually, it becomes an indirect cost because you're sharing the electricity bill. The same issues arise in determining how costs are spread within an organization. Businesses often develop models for allocating indirect costs to business units. The allocation scheme can be the subject of debate and consternation, as each business unit may feel its profit measurement is unduly burdened by an unfair share of the indirect costs. Reporting of segments is often facilitated by some form of contribution income statement. It's an internal use only document. It identifies each segment's controllable cost elements and costs that cannot be traced directly to a subunit are considered only at higher levels. Let's look at an example to show how this can operate. Zen Computers is a diversified company with two divisions, computer hardware and system support. The hardware unit focuses on personal computers, that is PCs, and personal digital entertainment devices, or PDEs we'll call them. And so here's their report, and we can see we look at the contribution margin for each product and the division in the aggregate. The contribution margin, remember, is sales minus all variable cost, whether it's variable product cost or variable SG&A. From that amount, we'll subtract controllable fixed cost, that is, costs that are controllable by management of that segment and directly traced to that segment, such as the supervisor's salary within the segment. We'll subtract those to find a controllable contribution margin, and that's a key number in evaluating management performance for an applicable unit. We'll also subtract certain uncontrollable fixed costs that may not be controllable by management, but are definitely incurred by the segment. An example would be property taxes or insurance, for example. Subtracting those amounts gives us the segment margin for PCs, for PDEs, and for the division. There were certain non-traceable costs. Non-traceable items are directly traced to the overall division, not individual products, and so we're not allocating those to the PCs or PDEs. The division total is going to be carried forward into a successively higher aggregation report that we'll see in just a moment. But first, consider that segment margins were computed for each product. That helped identify if each product is supporting its embedded cost structure. Segment margin differs from the controllable contribution margin. Management is charged with controlling certain costs. A business unit may incur additional fixed costs that are beyond their control. That's why we break this out in our segment income statement as we've done. An uncontrollable fixed cost must be considered in evaluating unit viability, but not necessarily in assessing the performance of a particular manager. So those are two discrete elements that need to be evaluated, management effectiveness as well as the unit's viability. Now here is the roll-up, so I've shaded the hardware division. That's just a roll forward of the information from the preceding combination of PCs and PDEs. We'll have similar items. We'll calculate the contribution margin and take into account our other elements adding across to get the company total. But notice the segment margin was 5400 for hardware, it was 1500 for systems, but there's still general corporate expenses that we need to subtract in finding the overall net income for the business. The general corporate expenses we do not trace or assign to a particular division. The point of the case study was to show how contribution income statements can remove bias that can result from arbitrary allocations of common cost. It is also sometimes helpful in identifying which business segments are targets for expansions, restructuring, or even discontinuing. Occasionally, a business may report external information about segment performance. This is actually driven by very specific, generally accepted accounting principles and rules.
However, before I get into that, I want to point out that management may be reluctant to share this disaggregated information. They may not want to attract the competition of a competitor or they have particularly strong performing units. On the other hand, they may not want to call attention to their mistakes either. They may rather mask this. That's why GAP gets into having a full disclosure about certain segment information. And so the reporting rules require public companies to present a limited amount of financial information for each business segment. This generally consists of revenue, income, and identifiable assets in use by each significant segment of the business. There are specific mathematical tests for determining, generally 10% type tests, for determining when a segment's revenue is significant separately as compared to the total organization. Similarly for operating profits and assets in use by the business. There's a reconciliation of the corporate totals. And it might look like this. This example is repeated in your textbook, so you can see it and look at it in more detail if you wish. Here's a business that has an electrical product segment and a galvanizing services segment. And we're not going to look at the specific details here, except to note that we do have sales for each segment. We have our operating income for each segment. And we're dropping down and showing total assets in use by each segment. I've skipped over that middle part there, which is the reconciliation of segment income to total corporate income, which takes into account general corporate expenses, interest costs, and so forth. Businesses will also need to report information about depreciation and amortization and capital expenditures by significant segments. And so a fairly robust set of information, maybe not as detailed as the internal information we looked at, uh, maybe following a little bit different classification scheme, but still giving sufficient information to allow users of financial statements to look inside beyond just the consolidated results reported by the business, but to look inside the business and see how specific business units are performing.